Bye. Usually works with the undergraduates, works with tonight audience. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, uh, welcome to tonight's event, the inaugural lecture of Professor Enrique Arroyo. Uh, my name's Kenny Weir. I'm the acting head of department in physics at the moment, and I have the pleasure of introducing the event this evening. Also, as the first person to speak, I have to take care of the housekeeping duties, which are that the fire exits from this, uh, this lecture theatre are two at the back and one at the side. And if there should be an alarm, the, uh, uh, the rallying point is on Queen's Gate. But, uh, and there are no planned alarms, so if it does go off, <laughs> please leave the building. So I'm, uh, I'm only the head of department for a short time in, in, this, in this acting role. Uh, so I'm really delighted that Henrique's uh, inaugural has fallen into my, my time in office. Delighted for a couple of reasons. First, it guarantees me a front row seat. Uh, and second, that it is really a very important part for the department to get together in events like this and actually celebrate uh, uh, events such as the promotion of our staff to, to the role of professor. But in this role, it also means I have a duty this evening, which is int to introduce our speaker. So, Henri uh, completed his undergraduate studies in his home country, Portugal, but came to London to Queen Mary and Westfield College to do his PhD, and has been in London ever since. Uh, soon after completing his PhD, he joined Imperial College as a, a research assistant. And that was when he started working in dark matter searches specifically, uh, and in particular in the technology behind the detectors, and I'm sure we'll hear much more about that tonight. Uh, he started working on, on what was Zeppelin II, I think, and then when he moved on to his uh, appointment to the academic staff in 2005, he continued on those Zeppelin projects, Zeppelin II, Zeppelin III, the deployment in the Bulldey mine, and further developments of the detector technology. Uh, that foundation that he, he start, that, that work that he started working on Zeppelin when he came to Imperial really has been the, the groundwork and the, the foundations for his career because he really has built on that as he's gone through his career to the point we're celebrating tonight where he is promoted to, uh, to professor. He has used that to build a national and international standing in the community, and he, is, he and his team are members of the LUX project, the Large Underground Xenon project in, in the States. And indeed, Henrique is the, uh, the UK PI and lead of the LUX Zeppelin part of, of that, uh, which will look at the experiments that are going to form part of LUX in the future. And again, we'll probably hear more about that. Now, I don't want to say any more about that, because that really would start to impinge on what Henrique, I'm sure, wants to say. Uh, but I did also want to say just a couple of words about Henrique as a, as a colleague. Uh, he is a great colleague in the department, because he so willingly contributes to everything that he does. Uh, teaching in a big department like this is a very important aspect of, of what we do, and Henrique has... Uh, taken that as a, a very important aspect of, of his duties. Most recently, one of his more recent jobs was as head of the second year lab, and that involves getting 250 students doing three experiments, three or four experiments over the period of a year, and getting all of the assessments. So it's not just getting the students lined up and fed through that system, he has to make sure that we've got the staff lined up to do the marking, and he took that in his stride. He, uh, he's also helped in the department in many ways. He's served on our, our teaching commitment. He really is committed to make sure that, as in the physics department at Imperial, we, uh, we provide a top-class degree program. He's also taken out on other duties in the department, as, as invited by the, the head of department. And uh, I'm struck that when Henrique is asked to take on another role or another duty within the department, he always says, let me think about it. Now, Experience of heads of departments is typically that when somebody says they'll think about it, they go off to find a way of coming up with an excuse so that they don't need to do that. <laughs> but I, I must say that 
Henri is actually the opposite of that, because when Henri says that, what he means is he's got to go away and think about it, understand what is being asked, and make sure that he feels he can come and make a positive contribution to that activity. And he readily volunteers and makes that positive contribution. So, Henri, thank you very much for that. So that's the physics side of things. I mean, I, I, I'm not very familiar with Hungaryk outside of the, the, the Department of Physics. So I gauged a little bit of opinion from others to find out what else might be interested in. He might be interested in. And uh, it was pointed out that, he, well, he, of course, he is Portuguese. And in Portugal, there is only one sport. And it's not cricket. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I believe he is a bit of a football fan. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have a local team in London. No. No, no. But I, yeah, but I, uh, but I have it on authority that your, uh, your, your team back home in Portugal is Academia. Okay. I also have it on authority that Academia is one of the teams in Portugal that is least likely to make any of the finals. <laughs> Uh, I also believe you've played a little bit of football because I've, I've heard rumours of five-a-side football matches up at the Bowlby Mines between the different experimental teams. Yeah. Uh, but it was also pointed out that those events always ended up with everybody retiring to the pub. So maybe this whole football thing is not about football. It's just a means to an end. So I, I, I won't go on. I'll bring us back to, to this evening's events and uh, the main task I have, which is the, the great pleasure I take in introducing Professor Henrique Orojo to present his inaugural lecture, Mining for Winds. Henrique. Good evening. So let me first get the mood right. Okay. And that part of the mood. So it's a pleasure to be here with so many familiar faces uh, facing me. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the universe. I'm going to talk about what the universe is made of. So as Kenny said in his very kind words, so something that interests me is the technology that we use to try to understand the universe. So I like to develop technology, yes, but with a, with a purpose. And that purpose is to really try to understand, in particular, what the universe is made of. And the universe is not quite made of, of what we thought. A few years ago, we now understand that the universe is actually more mysterious than we ever imagined. And in my day-to-day -day job, what I like to do is to try to develop uh, radiation and particle detector technologies that would allow us to go after very strange particles in, in very strange uh, places, deep in the ground mines, and hence the title. And these are the particles that we believe make up the dark matter in the universe. We now know that by far most of the matter content of the universe is not normal matter such as the atoms that make up you and me and the stars and everything, it is actually something different. We think and believe that uh, it's a fundamental particle, a new fundamental particle that we have not discovered, and there are lots and lots of them. But we think that it may be possible to detect these particles directly in the laboratory in the same way that we've detected new particles that were predicted, for example, the Higgs boson. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So most of the matter that makes up the universe is dark matter, this is the, uh, an image from a, a computer simulation that came out, it's the Millennium Simulation, came out in 2005 when I was appointed uh, to, to my uh, academic uh, role as a lecturer here. And what this is showing is the distribution of dark matter in a galaxy that we believe is consistent uh, with our own. So the, to the total amount of mass that is involved in these simulations is similar to the mass that we think our own Milky Way has. So how do you do this? You take many, many particles of mass. It doesn't matter what the size is, about a billion particles. You code Newton's laws of gravitation, whereby every particle attracts every other particle, and you allow a lot of time to pass. And you see how these structures evolve and start forming some kind of structure. And after you wait a long time, so in the, in the time scale of the universe, this will be a few billion years, you end up with an image like this. And you can see that there is some kind of distribution which is spherical, more or less. It's denser in the center than it is uh, on the outside, and it's kind of lumpy. But then you may ask, where is our galaxy in the middle of this? And I think the key is really here in this scale bar. So this distance there is 8 kiloparsec. So a kiloparsec is a, a unit of, of distance, a large distance, and this is eight of these units. And some of you may know that the Milky Way measures about, or we thought it measured about 40 kiloparsec across. So in fact, it looks a little bit like this. 
So what this is telling us, and that's why I still use this image, because it really changes the way in which you think about our own galaxy. So our own galaxy as a, a disk, a spiral galaxy, a disk of uh, stars and gas and black holes and all the rest of it is a, a rotating disk right in the center. And this is enveloped by this halo. We call it a halo of dark matter, which is much uh, bigger than the traditional confines of our galaxy. Uh, and it's also where most of the matter in these galaxies is. We are kind of more or less insignificant, about two-thirds of the way out, about eight kiloparsec from the center. Where we are, there are lots of stars and gas and so on, so we don't feel directly uh, the, uh, the, influ the influence of dark matter too much where we are. But we can, uh, we can still measure it if we measure our galaxy precisely enough. But if we look out to the outskirts of our galaxy, and especially if we look to other galaxies and places far away, what we can see, inevitably, is that everything is moving much faster for the amount of matter that we can see. So there has to be something else there that is making celestial bodies move about much, mat much faster than they should be moving. Uh, our galaxy, in particular, should not be stable if the only matter that it had uh, were the, uh, the stars and the gas that we can see. So there is something afoot here that we have to find out. So how do we know about this dark matter? So there is a type that, so we've known about this problem for a long time. It's actually an embarrassingly long time, almost a, almost a century. So 85 years, 90 years, we've known about dark matter. But it's such a radical change to the way we think about our universe that nobody believed this problem, nobody believed the initial measurements for many decades, until this lady, Vera Rubin, and her team came along. And they started making very interesting measurements of other spiral galaxies. So not our own galaxy, but other galaxies uh, far away. And to do that, you need to catch a galaxy that you see from the side, sort of edge on. And you do what you measure is you measure the frequency of starlight as a function of distance to the center. And you can do that by measuring the Doppler shift of the light. So a little bit like if you, you could tell the speed of an ambulance that's approaching you by the increase in pitch as it approaches you and then the decrease in pitch in the sound as it moves away. So you can do the same thing with light. It's called a uh, Doppler shift measurement. And you can measure in particular with some kind of... Uh, a uh, device that, uh, that measures uh, particular wavelengths, you can uh, tune this to the starlight, to the, to the frequency of, of, of the light from stars, and you can see how that particular measurement changes as you move outwards. So for example, in this case, so this is a disk, we'll be measuring this edge on, and we are going to be measuring, and this is a disk of stars, we're going to be measuring the Doppler shift of stars as we move here. Because the, the stars are moving towards the observer, that, that light is going to shift towards blue wavelengths a little bit, and we can measure that. And we can build a curve, a bit like this, where you plot the rotation speed that you measure for the stars at each point as a function of how far away they are from the center. And for this disk, what you see is that there is a linear relationship and the center is actually not moving at all. And then as you go further out, uh, the, the speed of each part of this disk is increasing in a linear fashion. But clearly our galaxy is not a disk, it's a, it has a, it's a spiral and it's not all moving at constant angular velocity. So we have to predict something for our galaxy, and we predict a curve a bit like this. So this is where most of the stars are. Clearly, the velocity increases a little bit. And as you start moving further out, it is natural to assume, just based on Newton, Newton, Newtonian dynamics, that the stars towards the edge of the galaxy should be rotating more slowly than the stars towards the center of the galaxy. Eventually, if you move so far away from the galaxy that you, you, sort of, you are way outside of, of, of the galaxy, you expect any bit of mass there not to be rotating very fast at all. Eventually, if you are at infinity, you shouldn't be expecting to be rotating by a galaxy that's in the other side of the universe. So this is what we expect. It's a curve that looks like this. At some point, the rotation of the stars in that part of the disk should be coming down. Unfortunately, that's not what Vera Rubin measured. She measured this for many galaxies, and we've now measured this for thousands of galaxies, and it is always a consistent picture. So this is a measurement for one such galaxy, the M33 Triangulum Galaxy. You can see here the, the stars, and you can do the Doppler shift measurements. So this is now distance to the center in some other units. And you can see that this is the prediction. As you run out of stars, it is expected that any, any old star that you find here should be moving more and more slowly. And this is the data. In fact, the rotation speed carries on increasing. So this suggests that there's a lot of mass there that is making these stars move faster, but we can't see it. And you can play another trick. We run out of stars, but you can start using gas. So there, are, there is hydrogen gas rotating in with a disk of matter that we understand well. You can do radio astronomy 
and you can pin down the Doppler shift of, of, of the gas uh, in the same way, and this carries on. So it's even more spectacular that this trend carries on. The gas is rotating ever, ever, more, uh, ever more quickly, and the stars are now very far away from this gas. So why is this gas sort of, why is the, the rotation speed of this gas uh, still increasing? So the explanations in, in my, essentially my first slide is that we are all sort of in, cloaked by this halo of dark matter, which has much more matter than what you can see here, both in the stars and in the gas. The ratio of dark matter to ordinary matter is about a factor of five. And the distribution of dark matter is much bigger than the distribution of normal matter. So clearly, as you go further out, you are enclosing more and more dark matter, and therefore you have to be rotating more quickly. So that's the shocking conclusion, or at least one of them. 20 years ago, we realized that we knew even less about the universe because we discovered that not only there was a lot of dark matter and there's about five times more dark matter than there is normal matter, but we discovered that the universe is not only expanding, but that expansion was accelerating and nobody really was uh, expecting this. So now there is another source of energy in the universe. So there's a lot of matter. Matter, as you know from Einstein, is energy. There's a lot of energy we didn't know about and then we discovered, hang on a second, now there's this dark energy pushing things out. There is even more energy we didn't know about. And it turns out that normal matter is only about 5, 4 or 5 percent of all of the energy content of the entire universe. So in fact, we know very little about the universe. So that was some evidence from astrophysics. There is some evidence from cosmology. We've become very good at photographing the early universe. So this is the cosmic microwave background. We can photograph the universe as it was when the first atoms formed. The universe was almost a baby, only 380,000 years old after the Big Bang. Uh, we are now 14 billion years after the Big Bang. So we can do this because these photons are still about in the sky and we can image what the universe looked like then. What we can then do is, you can see here, little perturbations where the temperature of this map is a little bit different and that suggests that the density, the matter density of the universe is a little bit different. And what you can do is you take a very simple model where the universe is driven only by two things that you don't know, dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter brings things together, dark energy makes them expand uh, ever more quickly. If you put this initial photograph uh, through this model, you end up predicting what the universe should look like at very large scales today. And lo and behold, what we observe is actually very close to that. So this is a fantastic model that allows us to understand the formation of structure in the universe starting from moments after the Big Bang, uh, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. We have a simple model with two dark fluids, dark matter, dark energy, that evolved the universe, the universe in a way which is really what we observe when we measure the large-scale structure of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and so on. So it's a fantastically successful model, but there is only one problem. We don't know what dark energy is, then we don't know what dark matter is. Apart from that, we are doing well. So with regards to the dark matter, so I mentioned that this is not the stuff that you and I are made of. We know that for many reasons. So by the way, when you look at the early universe, the dark matter problem is already there. Uh, and for reasons related to that, we think this is a new particle. So a particle that is fundamental is just very elusive and doesn't interact very much but we think it's a particle. The particles that make up uh, you and I are essentially protons and neutrons and, and, and some other quarks and muons and electrons and so on. We can account for all of those. So that's called the standard model of particle physics. It contains a number of particles, something like 17, I think it is. And we know what those particles are doing, but that is only 5% of the energy density of the universe. The rest is dark energy, dark matter, and there are many candidates for the dark matter. And the ones that I'm going to talk about are these weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So they are probably the, well, definitely the most popular candidates to explain dark matter. And the reason why they're so appealing is that they solve mostly all of the mysteries that we have in astrophysics, cosmology, and particle physics. So with one candidate, a type of particle that has these kind of properties, you can really explain the dark matter problem in all its forms at small scales of a galaxy, clusters of galaxies, early universe, and so on, and also solve problems in particle physics. We think we need more particles that are more or less uh, uh, of the same order of uh, mass as the Higgs boson. We think we need additional particles there, and maybe some particles could be the dark matter. So what are the properties that these WIMPs need to have? So these are conclusions that we make from very general observations. So for example, they have to be stable because the problem existed after the Big Bang and it still exists now. So whatever it was, it's still around today. They have to be neutral because charged particles interact with light very, very easily. 
that we know that we would have seen them uh, and we haven't. Uh, they have to be slow moving in the sense that they have to allow structure to form. Particles that are very fast, for example, neutrinos are also very uh, difficult to detect and, and almost invisible, but they're too fast. And every time you try to grow structure, they take the energy out. So we know that these things have to be uh, reasonably slow, reasonably heavy, uh, producing the early universe. And we know that they obey one of the fundamental forces of nature, the gravitational force, because that's how we infer that this thing exists. But there are four forces of nature. We know that it does not interact electromagnetically. That's an another force. We think it does not interact via the strong nuclear force. And we think that it might interact via the weak nuclear force. So the weak force is responsible for the radioactive decay. And we think there is no reason why this particle could not interact via the weak force. If it does, and so by, I say by design, because that's why it's a WIMP. It's a weakly interacting massive particle. It's a hypothesis that it does. There is a good theoretical motivation to think that it, that it might. And if it does, we can search for this particle in several ways. So we could try to produce it, for example, at the LHC. We could try to detect it indirectly by two particles coming together, annihilating, and producing something else, for example, in the center of the galaxy, where there should be lots of them. Or we could try to look for the collisions between these particles and ordinary atoms, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight. So it's a very simple collision. Particle comes in, reasonably heavy, not even very fast, hits a nucleus of an atom. That nucleus requires a little, recoils a little bit, and then the particle goes about its law-abiding business. And can we detect this nuclear recoil that comes out from that interaction? So that's uh, what we're trying to do here. So how do we do that? The so first thing we need to know is how many are there where we are. So we think that more or less, there are about one particle of these, one of these WIMPs per pint of volume at the position of the Earth uh, in, in our galaxy. So that's because we can see how things, how other stars, for example, move in our local neighborhood. Uh, and we think that there's on average about one part, particle per pint. So if you were to freeze everything inside a pint, there would be about uh, 100 GeV particle or one particle in there. We also need to know how fast they are moving. And we also think we know how fast they're moving. And out of these two things together, you can calculate how many should be going through you right now. And the number is about 100,000. OK, it could be a million, it could be 10,000, but it's a, it's a large number. And you may think, OK, I think I would have felt that if I had 100,000 wimps going through my fingernail per second. But in fact, you don't, because there are definitely, and we know this for a fact, 65 billion neutrinos from the sun alone going through each of your fingernails, and, and you don't feel a thing. And, and this is a fact. So this is something we can measure. So the flux of neutrinos is well understood, they go through the Earth, they don't touch anything for the most part, and we know that's going on. So this is not uh, a very far-fetched idea. So you have these particles, how can they interact uh, with a normal atom? The simplest thing they could do is just an elastic collision. So it's just a billiard ball collision where a particle comes in, knocks an atom, it goes, it goes back out again. Anything that they do that's more complicated than that is actually easier to detect. So this is the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is just a simple elastic collision uh, that, between a WIMP and a, a normal atom. What we produce is a nuclear recoil. So it's the recoiling of the nucleus that took the hit. That nucleus recoils a little bit, very, very little. It's a very low energy interaction. And we want to try to detect these things. That's very difficult because this is going to be a, a rare event at best. And it's also going to be a low energy interaction. So very, very little energy is deposited uh, between your particle and your medium. And it's difficult enough to do both, both of these things, but it's very hard to do both at the same time. It's even harder to do both at the same time. So the challenge is we need very special radiation detectors in very quiet places to try to understand how to detect these particles. So this is where I came in, maybe. Uh, so I have uh, sort of a, I don't know, ever since I was a student and undergraduate, I felt that I, I like radiation detection, particle detection. This is something that I really want to do. Uh, and so I'm plotting here uh, kind of a, the calendar years as a function of the energy of the particles that I have been working on over the years. A visible photon, for example, is around one electron volt. Uh, a very high energy proton at the LHC sits around there, for example. Uh, my microwaves are on this end. And this is calendar year since I was young until I was parked in front of a computer like everybody else. So I started uh, between 1990 and 1995, more or less, in Coimbra, working on a very interesting project, so liquid xenon, a liquid xenon-based positron emission tomography uh, project. So can you do positron emission tomography imaging using liquid xenon detectors, which is a really 
uh, really uh, challenging thing to do in this really nice project, detecting gamma rays of about these energies. And my role in particular was to measure the performance of these photomultiplier tubes. So these are photon detectors. I've got one example here. Uh, photon detectors that have uh, very good performance. They're very old devices. We've known about photomultiplier tubes for many decades. And try to measure if they work at low temperature. And the reason for the low temperature is you can only have liquid xenon at minus 100 degrees Celsius. And so you, if you want to detect photons from liquid xenon, you have to work everything at very low temperature. So after that, I came to London, to Queen Mary, as, as uh, Kenny mentioned. I was attracted by a totally different technology to measure radiation, in this case, with an application to astrophysics. So I worked to develop these superconducting hot electron bolometers that afterwards sort of became very fashionable, for example, for the detection of the uh, cos uh, cosmological uh, uh, signals, the cosmic microwave backgrounds. And so I spent a few years doing that. Uh, so I'm, in that case, we were detecting uh, millimeter waves. So this is a wavelength around here, uh, far infrared, that kind of radiation that is used in astronomical receivers. So this was a totally different type of technology, but I thought this is so new and so different, I want to do that. And then I decided I had to choose what I was going to do next. And I decided to make that quite deliberate. I was going to choose either I want to do this or I want to do that. And I decided for some reason, I'm not going to be driven by events. I'm going to actually decide. The two things I wanted to do were cognitive neuroscience and this dark matter business. And the reason for cognitive neuroscience is I thought physicists should be more involved in this kind of problem because at the, at the time they were not. So what is the mechanism for consciousness and all of that in the brain? The dark matter choice was because somebody came to uh, Queen Mary, gave a nice seminar on dark matter, and I thought, this is huge. I, why isn't everybody doing this? I need to do this. Uh, and so I decided I was going to do that. But I was diverted to work uh, with Dave Miller at UCL on calorimetry for the linear collider, the Tesla linear collider that uh, hasn't happened yet, but we kind of uh, sat down for about a year to try to design a calorimeter. So I went from an astrophysics group working at this end of the spectrum to a high energy physics group working at 10 to the 12 electron volts, which was kind of a cultural shock. And then I decided I would come back to the middle. And as soon as a post appeared here at Imperial working on dark matter with this uh, lovely liquid xenon technology, I decided this is what I want to do. Not, by the way, because I had worked with liquid xenon. It was actually a coincidence that I ended up working with liquid xenon here. That's because what the, that's what the group uh, here did. And they were a good group, and they had a vacancy at that point. So Tim Sumner hired me. And he couldn't be here today, but he had a really sort of strong influence in my career. And the first thing he gave me to do was to test more photomultiplier tubes at low temperature, which he had already done for the second time. <laughs> and after I sort of worked on a number of projects that I'll describe soon, both here and also at the Rutherford lab working with Nigel, uh, now I asked my postdoc a couple of years ago to test more photomultiplier tubes at low temperature. <laughs> so now I'm finally at the stage where I can just ask somebody else to do it, which is fantastic. So, Something else that I've been doing is to try to develop technologies for the radiation detection in space. Uh, so that is because it's a, also an interesting challenge. It's slightly higher energies, but these instruments are much smaller, so they have to be miniaturized. So I work on two particular projects, the radiation monitor for LISA Pathfinder, and I, I helped develop the ultra-miniaturized radiation monitor that's about sort of three or four centimeters long. Uh, and so that, that's also something I did in parallel for many years uh, until recently. So when I was putting this together, I realized that, okay, this gives me a as, as people say today, uh, an exciting portfolio of skills. <laughs> so I, I know a little bit about many things and maybe nothing about, maybe not too much about a particular thing. But that's useful if you want to do something like dark matter because it draws on from things from different communities and different uh, technologies. You can see the astrophysics side and the high energy physics side kind of come together in the middle. So these are useful skills to have. But when I was putting this together, I realized that most of my radiation detection was done away from the, earth of the, the surface of the Earth. And that wasn't intentional, but it just happened that I ended up working on underground experiments for most of my career, and everything else was above the surface of the Earth, both in a, a system to detect uh, millimeter waves at uh, a telescope in Hawaii and all of this stuff, and the, the laser pathfinder uh, and the other radiation monitor. And these things are actually flying, uh, so they, are actually, they have actually flown, uh, and, and this is still ongoing. So I haven't done anything exciting on the, on, the, on the surface of the Earth, because maybe that's too easy. I, I like a challenge in radiation detection. So how do you go about detecting WIMPs? So let's take a one kilogram target of some radiation detector. It doesn't matter what it is, just one kilogram. You're going to instrument this in some way. You're going to make it sensitive to very low energies, because these WIMPs are going to give you 
a small energy, low energy nuclear recoil, and the lower you can go on your energy threshold, the more WIMPs you're going to see. So that's important that it sees very low energies. The kind of rates that we are expecting, so it cannot be larger than this because experimentally we have already put limits at this kind of level. So this is one event in one kilogram in a thousand days. But it could be as low as that. So that's one event in many tons in many, many years. So, so these are, this is the challenge of what we are trying to achieve. If you take a radiation detector with one kilogram and you switch it on, this is what happens. All hell breaks loose. You see all manner of things. So typically, you will see maybe a 1,000 events per day. You see many events per second. And so out of those many events per second, you have many types of radiation from the environment, from the detector materials, from cosmic rays, and so on. So it's clearly going to be very hard to detect that rate on top of that background. It's not, not going to happen. There's a type of background which is fatal. Neutrons are also reasonably heavy. They also have no charge. And they can interact with nuclei to cause nuclear recoils, and they do. So if you have neutrons about in your detector, you cannot tell them apart from WIMPs. So we have to be very careful that uh, we don't have any neutrons that our background, our neutron background is essentially zero. So neutrons cannot be the dark matter because they are too short-lived and they interact in other ways we can see, but otherwise, that's bad. So I'm going to show, show you a little demonstration of what I mean, if I can switch the lights on, yeah. So this is a, it's not a Geiger counter, it's a scintillation probe. So in this case, we've got a little crystal which scintillates, emits a little flash of light as soon as the particle strikes it. And this flash of light is too faint for you to see with the naked eye. And so you have to take a photomultiplier, which is a very good photon sensor, and you couple these things together. And what we have here is essentially a combination between a small crystal and a small photomultiplier. So if I switch this on, and because I'm not carrying any radiation sources, it should be reasonably quiet. But as you can hear, it is not. Right, so this typically, this is what I'm talking about here in terms of you switch any detector on, you don't even need a kilogram, and you see a very significant count rate. I hope you can, can you hear at the back? Okay, so you can cheat a bit. There are many materials, including many natural materials that have radioactivity. And to demonstrate that, I'm cheating because I got some rock that I know has quite a bit of radioactivity. So I'm going to wave it about here. This is a bit of a pitch blend from Cornwall. So this is just natural rock, and most things have radioactivity at very low levels. This is a, has a bit more so you can hear it, but you can see that there is radioactivity absolutely everywhere. This here is a welding rod that you use when you're welding vessels together to make your detector. And it turns out that that's also radioactive. So in fact, everything is radioactive if you look closely enough, and that is one of the challenges of of building these experiments. So one thing you can do, there's a bit of lead, which is only a few millimeters, and you can do that. And although it's not a lot of lead, it makes quite a big difference. So it doesn't stop all of the radioactivity from the environment, but it makes quite a big difference. Part of the problem is I'm not capping the ends here. This lead is actually not thick enough. I can show you why not, so you can still hear it. So you need a lot of lead, a lot of shielding. Uh, and the other reason is if you have, you have cosmic rays, and you really cannot shield against cosmic rays that rain down on you, and they have such high energies, you really cannot shield uh, against them. Okay, so how do we go about building a wind detector now that we know all of this? So the first thing you have to do is you have to go underground, because that's the only way you're going to run away from cosmic rays. And you have to go about a kilometer, a mile, a couple of kilometers, and if you do that, you can reduce the cosmic ray rate by typically a million to 10 million. So it's not that you stop all of the cosmic rays on the surface on the, uh, on the way down. You still have some down there, but the rate is so small that we can cope with that residual rate. Very importantly, you need to select materials that have very low radioactive contamination, and everything has contamination. You and I, we are emitting something like 10,000 gamma rays per second, but we don't normally notice this. So we need to screen materials, we need to work with manufacturers, to use the right materials, they need to change their processes, not to contaminate the materials. It takes many, many years. So I showed you an example here of the welding rods. So we've, build, we've been building uh, at RAL this, uh, the cryostat for our next generation experiment. It took us two and a half years to find the right titanium to build a cryostat. At some point, we thought that the manufacturer had used these welding rods to weld one element or two, a few elements of the cryostat. And Pavel, we're sitting here, didn't sleep for three months until we actually 
were able to prove that that was not the case, that everything was fine. So you spend many years developing materials, processes, and so on to make sure that you use only the cleanest materials. You need to shield against gamma rays and neutrons, and these days we shield against both uh, in the same way. We tend to use very large amounts of water, so we put our detectors at the center of very large water shields, because water is not as efficient as lead, uh, but it's still pretty good. Ideally, you would like to veto neutrons, by which I mean that if there is a neutron outside, inside your geometry bouncing around, and neutrons can bounce around quite a bit, you would like to know this. And so you instrument the surroundings of your detector with a neutron detector, so that you know if there's a neutron around, you're not going to look for a WIMP at that time, because you know there's a neutron around. What you'd like to do also is to discriminate between nuclear recoils, which is what you're looking for, so when the nucleus gets a kick and it recoils, and electron recoils. And electron recoils are when the electrons in the atom get a kick. For example, interactions of gamma rays happen mostly to generate electron recoils. And so if we had, to have, if we had a way to separate between what is a nuclear recoil and what is an electron recoil, we don't have to worry about electron recoils. They are not WIMP interactions. So only the nuclear recoils are the important ones. There are many technologies, many experiments around the world. It's a very, very competitive field and they exploit several signatures that you can get uh, from radiation detectors. The kind of experiments that I've worked on for a while now uh, are in, in this side of the triangle. So we detect little flashes of scintillation, which is essentially the same mechanism that I demonstrated there, and we also detect ionization. What this means is that when the interaction happens, the atom can shake off other atoms and electrons from the atoms come off, and you can measure those. You can pull them with an electric field and amplify them, and you can measure the the electrons that come off that interaction. So what we do in these detectors, we measure for every single interaction, two signals, that one and that one. We use xenon as a target. Uh, xenon is probably the best dark matter target, if I say so myself. Uh, it has one problem, it's extremely expensive. So there is only nine parts per billion of xenon in air, and you have to remove xenon from the air. That's the only way you can get that. It's a noble, it's a noble gas. We use it as a liquid because we cool it down to minus 100 degrees. It's so expensive, there is a game where you can play the Xenon commodities market, and I have this game. And if you look at the cards, it tells you what are the uses for Xenon. And that's important to know because we're going to be buying a lot of this stuff. So one of the uses of Xenon are lighting. So high performance uh, car headlamps, even this is, a, this is a reasonably expensive uh, torch, which is a Xenon light. Uh, and it costs much more than an LED light, for example, an LED torch. So that's one of the big uses of Xenon, about a third. Another use is space propulsion. If you want to position or reposition a satellite, you can eject uh, Xenon ions out of the back of your satellite, satellite and use that as a, as a mechanism for thrust. And, and that is actually quite a big uh, uh, sort of uh, use for Xenon as well. And the third is equally strange, anesthesia. Xenon is a fantastic anesthetic. It just fits the right receptors in the brain, and it's also used widely as an anesthetic. So when we were trying to buy the Xenon for our next experiment, which would be about a quarter to a, f a, quarter to a fifth of all of the Xenon that is produced in the world, uh, we had trouble. And we had trouble because the market was rising and rising. We started designing the experiment. Two years later, we thought we cannot build this. It is unaffordable. We were already at many, many millions. We could not afford to do this. And suddenly, it started to come down. And the reason why it started to come down was because white bright LEDs came along, maybe two or three years ago. And they took up, took, uh, took, the market took them up very quickly, and the price of xenon lighting, xenon lighting started to be less attractive just because of LED lighting. And now the market is affordable again, and we were able to, uh, to buy the xenon we need. We almost have all the xenon we need, uh, so we were fine. Xenon is very good for dark matter searches. It's very heavy, so that is sensitive. It's sensitive to quite heavy WIMPs. It's also very sensitive to some neutrino interactions that are interesting physics too, so we like that for that reason. And it has no nasty radioisotope. So if you have xenon, as you get it from the air, you have all of these isotopes. It's all xenon, but they also have slightly different nuclear properties. And there's a mixture of them. And so that gives us a nice combination of good WIMP physics, good neutrino physics. And, uh, and because they are so short, if there are any radioisotopes, so any isotopes that have radioactivity, they are very short-lived. If you happen to activate the xenon, for example, because you have it on the surface or you put a neutron source next to it, the radioactivity decays away very quickly in a matter of weeks. So it's a very good uh, medium for that reason. So my next experiment is actually, in fact, the field of dark matter searches has become one of the leading uses of xenon in the world in, in, in the last couple of years. So we are one of the bigger 
uh, consumers of Xenon, and the manufacturers actually know that, and they call us up all the time. <coughs> me. So how do you instrument the Xenon? So the Xenon is the target. So that's what we are looking for, for the WIMPs to scatter against. So how do you instrument this? So this is where this remarkable technology comes up. It's called the two-phase Xenon time projection chamber. It's two-phase Xenon because we have liquid and we have gas. Most of our chamber contains liquid Xenon at minus 100 degrees. But on top of it, we leave a thin layer of gaseous xenon in equilibrium. Uh, and that's why it's called a two-phase xenon uh, detector, time projection chamber. So what happens, the particle comes in, and it scatters, and it collides maybe with a nucleus, if it's a wind, for example, or it collides with electrons. If it's a gamma ray, then it goes off. The first thing that happens is you've got a very small flash of light. So this is uh, actual data from the Lux experiment. You have a really fast and small flash of light. We call that the S1 signal. What also happens here is you release a few, you shake off a few electrons, and if you apply a strong electric field between the top of the chamber and the bottom of the chamber, you can pull these electrons up from the interaction, and you can move them up to the surface of the liquid. And when they get to the surface of the liquid, they go into the gas, and they create a second flash of light. So that second flash of light is the S2 light, and it happens after a certain time delay after the first, and that's the S2 pulse there. So this is a very neat way to transduce the ionization signal to a, again to another optical signal. So you have two optical signatures for every particle interaction, and there are two things you can do with them. So first, you can position, reconstruct the position of that interaction in three dimensions with very high accuracy. Within a millimeter, you can tell uh, where these interactions have happened, because the, in the horizontal plane, so the XY, you can just look at the splash of the light in this top array of photomultiplier tubes. So you have two arrays, one looking down, one looking up. In that top array, you can look at the, where the center of that light splash is. That gives you the X and Y. And the Z is essentially the time separation between the S1 and the S2. Because a signal that happens twice as deep, the S2 will take twice as long uh, to be generated. And so you can position that interaction in Z, in the Z coordinate, which is essentially this. So you are projecting the time. You're projecting the third coordinate into time. That's why it's called the time projection chain. Every signal, therefore, has S1, S2, you can get the position and you can do something else. You can tell if it's a nuclear recoil or an electron recoil just by the ratio of that area to that area. A large ratio, like this one, this is a gamma ray interaction, for example. If it's a small ratio, it could be a win. And so that's what we look for, is abnormally low ratios of this parameter. So we spent quite a long time, so maybe 10 years, working at, at Bowlby uh, in, in the Zeppelin program. So Bobby was a nice lab that was developed by Nigel and, and co, more or less, when I joined the collaboration around the year 2000, 2002, something like that. And it's, the, the lab is located one kilometer underground, and you can see what it looked like uh, here. This is the mine. So it's an active mine, which makes it quite an interesting thing. It's actually, we would go down with the miners every morning, and it's actually an active potash mine. I worked first on Zeppelin II for a few years. So you can see here. Uh, Nigel Smith and Roland from RAL walking their baby after construction. And this is actually me looking at the computer already at that early age. Uh, so that's what Zeppelin II looked like. But I spent most of my time working on a sister detector that we developed slightly later, that actually here at Imperial, called Zeppelin III. So Zeppelin III had more channels. So Zeppelin II had only seven photomultipliers. Zeppelin III had 31. It was an extremely challenging construction. It was made of ultra-pure copper. We had to make it here in the department, and the workshop downstairs uh, made this object. It took several years to do, uh, and we assembled it on level 11 because the in industry would not touch it. They would not uh, accept the bid because it was just too complicated to make an instrument fully out of copper. Uh, it was uh, actually quite a challenge to, to build. So we worked, I worked on Zeppelin III for a, quite a number of years. Eventually, after five or six years after we designed and constructed, it was ready to go underground. And this is one of the first signals ever coming out of Zeppelin III from underground. You can see a nice S1 here. So I took this myself, just pressing the trigger button on the oscilloscope. And this is not the first. I wouldn't lie, because the first was horrible. So maybe I took the second or the third signal. Uh, but this is a nice signal from Zeppelin III. Nice, sharp S1, big S2. This is what the experiment looked like and the team that was underground uh, on that day. And we were very proud. I mean, it took, uh, as you can see, this is 2007, and we started in around 2000, 2001. So this is uh, it's quite a challenging technology uh, to get to work. Once it's working, it's inside, encased inside a big 70-ton shield made of lead. And you don't see very much. You just see the data coming out. Uh, but it's a, a challenging thing. Around this time, in 2006, the BBC uh, made the Horizon program about dark matter searches. 
And that's the program where, uh, so that focused, as they call him, in, on Tim and his boys. That's what we were called. <laughs> and actually, they called me with my pants down <laughs> while I was changing, and they actually showed that in the actual program, which uh, to, to great hilarity of the rest of the collaboration. We concluded the program in 2012, and this is how well sort of we've done uh, in, in the UK program. This is how we plot results in our community. This is the mass of the WIMP, which we do not know. This is 10, 10 proton masses, one proton mass here, 100 proton masses, 1,000 proton masses. We don't know what the mass of the WIMP is. We think it will be more or less on this scale. And this is the probability of interaction with an atom, essentially. And so things down here are less likely to, it's a lower probability of interaction, and this is a higher probability of interaction. So if you search for that matter and you don't find any candidate events, what you do is you, put a, you set a limit where you are excluding everything above that line. And these are the limits that were put out by the UK collaboration, first using sodium iodide scintillators, which is a technology similar to this, and the rest is with the Zeppelin program over a number of years, and we went a number of orders of magnitude. Uh, that was, it was quite a, an exciting program. It was really hard work, but it was, it was, really, it was really exciting years uh, that I spent in doing Zeppelin two and three. This gentleman here is Peter Smith, who was at Raoul and then retired and now lives in LA and is still an active physicist and his wife. And they visited about a year ago, essentially to meet Gareth Jones and John Quimby here from Imperial, because it had been about 30 years that a meeting of these three gentlemen gave rise to the UK Dark Matter collaboration. Uh, and so it was a nice visit and everybody's still uh, going strong. And another person that I have to pay homage to is our esteemed sort of late colleague, Vadim Lebedenko. So Vadim was the person hired by Tim Sumner to come here and design Zeppelin III, and he actually built most of it. He was a remarkable, remarkable physicist. Uh, and he was actually one of the three authors of the original paper where this method of detection was proposed. So this was a Russian paper, and therefore ignored by most people because they were behind the Iron Curtain. But this is a, a very important radiation technology, which is now has been at the forefront of dark matter searches for many years, and he was one of the authors of that paper. In around 2012, the climate in the UK was difficult. There was no funding. We had followed the financial crash. The research councils were not doing very well either. We realized we need a much bigger collaborator if you're going to, much bigger collaboration if you're going to build something much more serious on a much bigger scale. So we joined our American colleagues in the Lux collaboration that had been designing and building the Lux experiment, and it was going to be deployed at the Sanford Underground Research Facility, the SURF lab. So SURF was built in the former Homestake mine uh, which is a very famous gold mine. It's real sort of South Dakota frontier territory. This is one of the first gold mines uh, of the original gold rush in the United States. So the lab was redeveloped after the mine shut down maybe 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's a small lab, but it has everything we need, and it's located one mile underground. There are only two and a half interesting things in South Dakota. The Black Hills are really interesting. It's really beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, this is the head frame that sits on top of the mine, and we are a mile on the ground there. You can see that represented here. Uh, Mount Rushmore is not far away, so that's one of the attractions. And the other is the Sturgis Rally, which is the biggest motorbike rally in the world. And that is something to be seen, because you will not have seen anything like it, I, I promise you. This is the town of Leeds, where the mine is located. And this is the original hole where they started digging for gold a couple of hundred years ago. And so now there's a mine, there's a, a town which still has about 3,000 people. Uh, and there is this massive, massive hole they call the open cut that is still, is still there. The conditions on the ground were difficult, and they had to blast and dynamite the rock and move things about and so on, so they had horses and donkeys to do the hard work uh, on the ground. And so I'm happy to say we don't do that anymore. We now have PhD students to do the hard work. <laughs> so that's inside the lab. It's, it's kind of cozy. It's not a big lab. And this is the water tank that shielded Lux. And this is inside the water tank. It looks a bit more roomy. So this is, the, this is Lux itself here. There's a low background titanium cryostat. Now we have 250 kilograms of liquid xenon. We have about 120 photo multipliers. So we run, we joined the collaboration when the experiment had been, uh, had been uh, built, but had not been deployed on the ground yet. And so we work with our uh, American colleagues on that. Our first result came quite quickly, and it was very, very successful. It was, we had two results, one that was short, and the other one that was quite quite a long run that was uh, more sensitive, but the first one actually had more impact. So this was only from a run of about uh, 90 days, I think it was. And 
we didn't discover a signal consistent with dark matter that allowed us to set a limit that was by far the world's, the world's best limit on dark matter. I'm not going to focus on the curve to higher masses. That was clearly world living, but I'm going to focus on what happens at lower masses. And this is the result from Lux, and we excluded everything above it. And at this time, there were other collaborations making claims that they were seeing a hint of a dark matter signal. And so people were all, ex all excited that we could just be on the verge of a big discovery. And Lux, because it was more sensitive than anything else, Lux should have seen hundreds of signals from dark matter. And we saw nothing. And so that allowed us to put a limit here that really ruled out all of these sightings. So this paper was the second high highest cited paper in 2014. Uh, it has 1,500 citations or more now. And the highest cited paper is actually uh, the BICEP result, which turned out to be incorrect. So we actually had the best results, the best physics paper of 2014. It was all over the press. There were many amusing comments. Uh, I particularly like this one. Dark matter experiment has detected nothing, researchers say proudly. <laughs> and even when I mention it, I actually I also feel that myself I kind of fall for that trap. But you have to understand that if you spend really almost 10 years sometimes to build a dark matter detector, if you're not going to find anything, which is of course what you want is to find something, but if you're not going to find it, at least you want to not find something better than anybody else. <laughs> and in a world where there are 20 or 30 dark matter experiments running all the time, if, if you're going to fail to find it, you want to be the best experiment still to fail to find it. This is where we are tonight. So this is the same parameter space, many other factors of, of 10 in, in cross section. This is the mass of the WIMP. There are now two other experiments. So Lux is done, it's been decommissioned, we are moving on to the next experiment. There are other experiments now that have joined Lux with more or less the same sensitivity, the Xenon, One Turn Project, and Panda X. And they have something in common. These are all two-phase Xenon experiments. And if you go back, you need to go back almost a factor of 100 to find the first experiment that is not a liquid Xenon experiment. So this is a technology that was partly pioneered here in the UK and partly here at the Imperial College. One thing that I like to plot is the first dark matter result from colleagues in, out in California. Uh, the first publication of a dark matter result is 1987 with a tiny germanium detector. And we have made progress of about a factor of a million improvement in sensitivity over 30 years. And not many areas of physics can claim to have improved a factor of a million in 30 years. This is actually quite good progress, although it feels painful, but it's actually quite good progress. So now we are moving on from the Zeppelin program, Zeppelin 1, 2, 3, Lux. We're going to do Lux Zeppelin, the rather unimaginative uh, name. So we call it LZ. So not LZ, we call it LZ. Um, and it's a, we're going to use the same water tank that is already there for Lux. So we extracted Lux. LZ will be a much more complicated instrument with several layers of detector. It will have seven tons of active liquid xenon and a couple, two or three other tons of inactive liquid xenon. Uh, that's the experiment that we are all uh, building now. Uh, LZ, as I mentioned, had, has several layers of detector that I'm not going to explain in great detail, but essentially is to, to exploit not only the fact that Xenon is a great detector, so we want a lot of it, but also the fact that we, we want a very good veto. So things that detect, detectors that detect neutrons very well, so that we know that if, if there is something happening at the same time in the target, I need the veto, so if the target is here and that's the veto, we know this is not a WIMP. So that is something that will give some added sensitivity to, uh, to LZ. So that veto is 20 tons of liquid scintillator, so not a crystal, it's a, it's a special uh, liquid. In the center of LZ, we expect about one low energy event per day uh, in, in 5.6 tons. So that's very, very different to about 100 counts per second uh, in a tiny crystal like that. So this is the, the sort of amount of progress that we have made in this technology. That one event per day, it's overwhelming, overwhelmingly electron recoils that we can discriminate away. So we end up being able to run for several years with a background of only two or three, four or five, six events of, of actual background because most of the interactions will be electron recoils. The UK is heavily involved in LZ, so this is a good partnership between US universities and national labs and about nine institutes in the UK. Imperial is involved in, in many parts. I'm particularly involved in the design and construction of the central xenon detector. There's been a lot of uh, help here from the department and uh, the people that work with me, Alfredo and Bryce and the students and so on. Also, uh, our electronics workshop, Maria and Vera, have been fantastic at manufacturing many parts for LZ that's taken a few years and we are pretty much, we have delivered what we have to deliver for LZ in this work package. We do have done a lot of testing of components in liquid xenon. We are 
planning or preparing uh, one of the data centers for LZ, also here, so led by Antonin and our computing uh, colleagues um, here at Imperial. And so this is a very good contribution uh, to, to the project. This is where we are now. So those are the three experiments. And this is where we want to get to. So that's the LZ sensitivity. So my student Ibles has been working on this uh, on these plots and uh, understanding exactly what the sensitivity of LZ is going to be. There are many models of dark matter, but some of the more popular, sort of there are sort of these scams for these models. And this is a possible model, and this is the most uh, attractive point out of all this set of models. And so it could be that dark matter is there. And if these models are right, this is a very good place to look. And because our sensitivity is below that, we can actually, we can actually see this win. So there's no guarantee that this model is the right one, but there are many models that LZ would be able to access. So one thing that has always interested me is to try to push the technology even further, and that's something I've been doing for a number of years. LZ is now clear, we'll take care of the standard WIMP, so we'll just go down that parameter space almost as far as, as we can go. Uh, but there are also well-motivated WIMP kind of models at very low masses, for example, and that's something that I'm interested in. So the question is, so that's the LZ sensitivity curve that I showed you in the previous plot. Can we go this way? Can we probe lower masses so as little as... As, as, as light as a proton, for example, or a few protons. To do that, you need to improve the threshold of the detector. You need to detect light, smaller and smaller energies because lighter WIMPs give you smaller energy deposits. You need to be able to detect smaller and smaller energies. So this is good. This is Guinness, but you can do better. So can we do better? If you do better, another type of physics uh, becomes uh, available to you, which is to look for neutrinos in a type of interaction which is very similar to that of WIMPs. It's this coherent elastic neutrino scattering. Again, a neutrino comes in, scatters off a nucleus, the nucleus recoils, really very low energy. It's so difficult to detect this that it was only done this year for neutrinos, not for WIMPs. It was only done this year for the first time after 42 years of searching for this interaction. So now we know this interaction exists, and if LZ has the performance we think it will have, we should be able to see even supernova neutrinos, for example, 100 events from a supernova going off in our galaxy in a type of neutrino interaction that no other detector is able to see. So how do we do this? One thing that we realized, uh, that's something I've worked on over the years with several students, is that we could actually see individual electrons coming out from the liquid in these detectors. And so it became clear that we had enough sensitivity in the S2 channel, so that's the, the S2 channel is the drifted charge that gets emitted to the gas. The smallest thing you should be able to see is when one electron gets shaken off, drifted to the surface and emitted into the gas. And then we started looking in Zeppelin II to these signals and realizing, actually, this is what this is. We are looking at these rogue, tiny, tiny signals, and this is what they are. This is one electron just being kicked out from the liquid and being amplified in the gas. If you can detect that well, you are done. There is no more optimization because you can already see the smallest signal that you can, that you can ever create uh, in these detectors. So they are now used uh, routinely for calibration, monitoring the detector, but they have really potential for low energy physics because a very low energy interaction might have two elections, and a, an interaction with twice the energy might have four elections. And if you can count them, then you can do this physics. So that's what we demonstrated in Zeppelin II, that if you histogram the very, very small signals, you end up looking at one electron. This distribution is one electron coming out from the liquid into the gas. Uh, and I did that with my first PhD students. And then in Zeppelin III again, we then got a beautiful distribution for one election. So we can resolve one election. We can detect one election even in two tons of liquid xenon. Uh, this is an extraordinarily low threshold. So then we thought, OK, we are done. We can now go look for low energy interactions. And we realized that we couldn't, that there was a huge background of these low energy interactions that we didn't understand. Uh, and that turns out to be related to our inability to apply high fields to liquid xenon detectors. And we started to notice this in Zeppelin II and our prototype here 10 years ago. Then we started talking to other collaborations and everybody had the same, pro the same problem, that you need to apply a field across the liquid xenon to move the electrons up. And everybody was failing. We can apply a field that's just much lower than, than what, you should, uh, that what you should be applying. We didn't understand why. And then it turns out that they seem to be related with the emission of spurious electrons from these detectors. And I thought this is a good area to, to do some R&D on. Uh, and so that's what we did. So we set up an R&D uh, project up in the lab that Alfredo has been doing for a number of years, where we've measured uh, very thin wires that are used in the electrons that we use uh, uh, to create these electric fields. And what we saw was exactly what we saw in Lux and in Zeppelin, is that these electrode meshes that are very thin, that are made from very thin wires, 
tend to emit electrons for reasons that we really didn't understand. Uh, and, and that seemed to be the problem. So if we could solve that problem, so if we could prevent these meshes from emitting electrons, we could not only apply higher voltages to these detectors, but we could also do physics at very low energies. So this quick R&D took about four years, and Alfredo has kind of devoted the last four years of his life to do this. Uh, we tested, we made almost 30 tests in liquid xenon, and each test takes about a month to prepare, to do, to analyze the data. So this is a quite fa painful thing. We tested many wires, very thin wires, less thin wires, treated in this way, in that way, and so on. And we think we understand the physics now, and this is important for this technology, also for neutrino detection, not just for dark matter. And we think even better that we found a way to treat these wires in a way that prevents them from emitting so many electrons. We realize that untreated, this is a, the number of electrons per second, and we, we can actually, we have a sensitivity to measure these things that's spectacular. We can measure electrons one by one. This is the number of electrons per second, the electric field, and as we ramp up the field, it takes about an hour to ramp up the field very slowly. You can see electrons coming off, coming off, and then some big episodes with lots of electrons, and we count them one by, we count these electrons one by one. Then we try to electropolish these wires. That helped a bit, but not too much. And then we actually do, did just some chemical passivation, and that almost solves the problem. So this is actually the cheapest thing you can do. So we're very happy with this. We are about to publish this. It's a, we killed two stones with a, no, we killed two birds with one stone. <laughs> uh, maybe we can do the physics as well as solving the high voltage problems that the whole community has been trying to understand what's going on for a few decades. We would like to do the same for S1. S1 is harder, it's just single photons, everything, there are single photons everywhere. Uh, and so Bryce and, and Nelly, my student, are working on trying to find a way to use single photons to do physics. Uh, it's extremely challenging, and that's why we had to go back and test more photon multipliers at low temperature, because we really need to understand how these devices work uh, with sort of in great detail. All right, to do all of this, we need a great team, and I think I have a great team, and I have several great teams, in fact. Uh, this is the international LZ collaboration, or about half of it, in a meeting at SURF uh, earlier this year. And, and the, the LZ collaboration is really a fantastic collaboration. It's about 250 people or, or so with fantastic physicists, engineers, students, postdocs, academics. And this is the UK part, uh, the, the nine institutes in the UK, Imperial, uh, Pavel and Roy are here from the Rutherford Lab, uh, and Jam is also here uh, from UCL, Hans from Oxford and so on. This is really a team that came together from Zeppelin, also from, uh, uh, from the Eureka sort of cryogenic project that we came together a few years ago. A few uh, universities have joined us since, and this is really uh, a fantastic team. Because we are here at Imperial, I really need to thank a very large number of people, but because I will forget all of their names, I decided just to show you what they look like, <laughs> and I will still forget some people. So these are students and colleagues uh, and uh, technicians and everybody that uh, uh, I've worked with over the years that have helped uh, in particular in the, in the dark matter searches. And a couple that uh, I couldn't find photos for and they don't seem to interact with the electromagnetic radiation so I just chose a placeholder for them. So in particular I have to ask, I mean the people that really had an influence in my career because I worked with them very closely for many years are Tim Sumner who unfortunately could not be here tonight, uh, and Nigel who is a visitor in our group uh, but originally from Raul and now uh, as no lab, but also all of my students and postdocs, uh, and, and so it's, it's been a pleasure to, to work here. Finally, as Roy would say, the home office has, uh, has been very helpful too, uh, and so I have to dedicate uh, this to uh, my success so far to Ellie and to Marge and my parents that have been really fantastic and very supportive, and they know that in order to do this, this is a tough job that sort of the family can, can suffer, and they've been very understanding. My wife understands because she's also an academic and ex-physicist, so, so that's a good start, but they've been fantastic throughout all of my career, and even the cat is supportive. So my mum also, she's also here today. My dad couldn't be here because it was a little bit unwell, uh, but better now, uh, but so a big thank you uh, to you. Finally, why mining for wimps? So I chose this title that I've used in many talks over the years. So part of the reason is because it's kind of, it feels like, like you are working, when you're working on the ground, you are working in a special place. It's an unusual place. If you haven't worked on the ground before, it's not like anything you've ever, you've ever done. I like that. It, it feels like if you're going to discover something important about the universe, that's about the right place to do it because it's so unusual that I, I also felt that we were doing something important because it was such an unusual setting. It's kind of frontier science. I stole just this sentence from Nigel because I heard him use earlier today and I added that. More, of, more often, it feels like really hard work. 
and mining for WIMPs most of the time really feels like you are mining because it's just so tiresome. It really you are moving around on the ground with your with your lamp and your rescue your self rescuer and uh, and batteries and everything and it kind of just feels you have to walk a lot on the ground and it and sometimes you go two weeks without seeing the sun because you go down and it's dark and you come back out in this uh, and, and it's dark and you do this, do this a couple of weeks and it really feels like really hard work. Uh, so I think this kind of sums it up that. Everybody works very hard at their jobs, but I think there has to be a reason that uh, gets us up in the morning. And for me, is that okay? We're all in the gutter, but in the gutter, but I like to think that I'm looking at the stars in some way. Thank you. Did I have a lot? Twenty minutes. <laughs> So thank you, Enrique, and good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name's Nigel Smith, and I'm the, uh, currently the executive director of Snow Lab, which is uh, a deep underground facility in Canada. Uh, so it's a pleasure to come back to Imperial College. I started my career in dark matter here as a research associate with Gareth Jones, who's uh, in the audience. And so it's a pleasure to come back here. I currently have a visiting chair here, and Enrique took the opportunity to make me work for it, so I was teaching the postgrads this morning. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be here because it's minus 10 degrees back home in Canada. <coughs> it's snowing, and my wife is shoveling the driveway. So, uh, yeah, I think when I go back home, I'm going to be shoveling for the next two weeks or so. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be in, uh, invited by Enrique to, uh, to be here and give the vote of thanks. Uh, as Enrique has said, we've worked together for many years. And uh, when he said, I want you to give the vote of thanks, of course, I thought, well, what does that mean? So I, I asked around, do we, do we have to sort of vote on whether he should become a professor? You know, how are we going to do this? But before, we, uh, before I come to thank Enrique formally, um, I just wanted to give some background as well to my experiences of working with Enrique and the, uh, the time that we've had. So as uh, Enrique went through his career, I first became aware of Enrique uh, around about 2001 when uh, David Miller at UCL said he got a great postdoc who was interested in, uh, in doing dark matter research. Uh, and, and so that was the, f the first uh, uh, point that we really had contact. Uh, but it, as Enrique also mentioned, it became clear that we'd actually had contact before then. Um, and that was, uh, that was a point where I was giving, trying to get uh, support for the UK Dark Matter program. So Monday, December the 11th, 2000, I gave a talk at Queen Mary. And Enrique was in the audience at that time and felt sufficiently... Uh, impelled by the science that we were trying to do, that he committed the next 20 years of his life to doing this. So, you know, I think in terms of my own personal research career, that's got to be the most impactful talk I've ever given, right? Yeah. I'm ever so sorry. <laughs> yeah. My profuse apologies. So, um, Enrique joined the, uh, the Imperial Group, and then in 2005, we had an opportunity to... Um, set up a joint appointment between the Rutherford Lab. I was group leader of the, the Dark Matter uh, Lab at the time, uh, the Dark Matter group there. And we had a joint appointment, and you know, we were delighted that uh, Enrique applied and was successful in that, and he joined us uh, March the 1st, 2005. And uh, it, that, that's the point where I really became first aware, I think, of the tenacity and drive that Enrique has. Uh, and a joint appointment is very hard. So you're, you, you basically have two bosses. And you've got to try and draw together two groups, from, one from the Rutherford Lab, one from Imperial College. And at times, you know, act as the diplomat between, uh, between these two groups. And Enrique obviously did a fantastic job there. Uh, you know, he really undertook all these tasks with his inimitable drive that he's got, his passion for the science. I think the, the passion for the work that he does came out really well in the talk that Enrique's just given. Uh, you know, I say that... Tim, Tim and I were his bosses. In reality, I think Tim and I felt that he, yeah, Enrique was already the boss. Yeah, he was giving us uh, fulsome comments about how we should be doing things. Uh, Enrique and I, I think, make a really good team because, yeah, uh, to be honest, I think I'm a bit more broad brush, a bit more cavalier in my approach. <laughs> 
to the, to the way we do things. And Enrique uh, has a great eye for the detail, and that's what makes him such a fantastic physicist, is he really, you know, picking up single electrons coming out from the, the surface of a liquid xenon detector is just amazing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what made us such a good team, is that I was able to, you know, basically take a very broad brush view in the knowledge that Enrique would pick up all the pieces afterwards and make sure everything worked. The, uh, the Zeppelin team was a small collaboration. We had huge, large ambition, and you know, as Enrique has um, described fulsomely here, um, you know, we were actually able to deliver on that ambition. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a period of frontier science. I mean, that's absolutely what it was like working underground. It's characterized by hard work, you know, general exhaustion, just getting up to the mine, getting underground. It takes a toll, and uh, yeah, you're working underground for extended periods. Enrique told me today that uh, he'd look back on the records, and he had the, long, the second longest shift at 14 hours, and I pipped him by three hours, I think, in those shifts. But it just shows you the sort of dedication that is needed when you have these teams. And that led you know, probably to too much beer, too many pork pies in the pub afterwards. But it was uh, yeah, an ultimately successful, um, successful program. Uh, and then Enrique was pulled back here, and I think uh, after, I guess it was four years as a, of, of a joint appointment, uh, he was then pulled back to Imperial College full time. And of course, has uh, yeah, had a, a, a tremendous career since then and picked up on that on, on the physics. Um, an area that Enrique hasn't really talked about is, is one of the realities of doing research is that there are, there are many management systems that you have to understand. How do you get money? Is, is obviously a key thing for, for research. And uh, for Enrique Sins, he picked up a lot of the project management and a lot of the interactions with the funding agencies for the Zeppelin program. Uh, you know, it was a job I used to do, so again, my apologies, Enrique, that yeah, I landed that on you. But he, he uh, again, uh, showed commensurate, uh, consummate skill in being able to do this. And um, as an example, during the Zeppelin III project, there was an upgrade where we needed to replace some photomultipliers. And the funding agencies were a little bit worried about this process, because, and they asked for a report every week on how this uh, company was doing in producing these photomultipliers for us. So every week, Enrique had to you know, basically submit a report. And he, he told me there's 34 reports <coughs> in the file that goes with that. So for basically over half a year, Enrique was uh, really under the microscope. So he's clearly adept at navigating the, uh, the oversight processes in the UK, you know, treating them like the contact sport that they actually are. I mean, it's football coming back, I guess. Uh, I think the, uh, <coughs> that had a you know, huge benefit in that the credibility that Enrique then brings to the project management has really served the LZ collaboration well within the UK. So that there, is a, there is a level of credibility, a level of confidence that the funding agencies have in the delivery of, the, uh, of, of these sort of detectors. And these are very complex detector systems that you, um, that you have to undertake. And of course, it can also translate American into English now, because you've got to work with the American funding agencies. So that, that helps. Uh, and from the, from the LZ side of things, well, one of, one of the things that became very apparent is that he's very quickly integrated into that community. And in some sense, actually promoted the work here at Imperial College and within the UK to a wider, wider audience. I don't think that the, uh, the international community really was keeping an eye on the Zeppelin program as much as it should have done. And Enrique has managed to, uh, to counterbalance that. Now, he talked about the strong sense of the, the Zeppelin collaboration. And uh, you know, there were many, many memorable meetings that we held around the, uh, the various institutes who were collaborating with us. Uh, the most memorable being in Quimber and Moscow. Well, I'll say the Moscow meeting was memorable. The amount of vodka that our collaborators required us to drink, yeah, absolutely required us to drink, means that not all of it was memorable. But, uh, yeah. Suffice it to say, we brought everybody home. <laughs> and we didn't have any TV contro remote controls in our hand carry. Uh, I think it's also appropriate, I mean, Enrique has done this, but it's also appropriate to thank Ellie and the family. Uh, you know, this takes a huge amount of commitment to, uh, to drive these sort of research programs forward. And it is a challenge. I think it is a challenge, especially when you have a young family and you're spending a lot of time underground. And uh, yeah, I think that in itself is, uh, you know, is a testament to the support that Enrique has had from the family. 
So my, uh, my own regard for Enrique was sufficiently high that as soon as I went to Canada, I thought, okay, I'm going to make him work. So I put him on one of the advisory committees that we have at, uh, at Snow Lab. And this is, uh, it's like our top level international advisory committee. So it's absolutely critical to allowing us to, to move our science program forward. And again, Enrique took to that task. You know, he said, let me think about it, but did take to the task and uh, contributed um, really well in terms of helping Snow Lab forge its own, uh, its own research program. You know, he was telling us exactly what he thought of the program and how we could make it better, how we could improve that, uh, that sort of thing. Now, of course, what goes around comes around. And you know, last year, he had me, uh, Enrique, chaired a panel in the UK on neutrino physics. And I don't know whether it was you, Enrique, but I ended up on that panel. So yeah, you, you sort of, uh, what comes around goes around in terms of the work that you do. So overall, um, yeah, I think my vote of thanks extends far beyond the work that he's done uh, on the, the, the science that has been described tonight. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege to work with you over the last few e years, Enrique. You know, it's fantastic to see the continued development of the uh, dark matter research here within the UK. And it's uh, an honor to have you as a friend and a colleague. So I would like to congratulate you on your appointment to chair, which happened last year, I believe. Uh, but congratulate you on your appointment to chair, and I'll call on everybody to vote the thanks to Enrique. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. That draws the lecture to a close. So uh, thank you to you all, and uh, if guests staying for drinks, those will be served on level eight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.